Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our weekly AJA Zoom event. Welcome to new people joining this week, and welcome also to people watching on Facebook Live, to people listening to the audio replay, which is being broadcast every Thursday at midday, as well as Sundays at 4 p.m. on JA Community Radio, which is FM 88 in Melbourne or j-air.com.au. My name is Robert Gregory. Also on the screen, you'll see Dr. David Adler, president of the AJA, as well as our guest, from, guest tonight is from Israel, Yoni Ben Menachem. Format will be Yoni making some opening remarks, then there'll be a short interview, and then there'll be a chance for the audience to ask questions. If you'd like to ask a question, the best way is to raise your hand with the reaction button. Uh, you can also uh, post a written question, and, and if we have time, uh, we'll, we'll try and get to some of those. So our guest tonight, Yoni Ben Menachem, is an Israeli journalist and a senior researcher at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, JCPA. Previously, he's been CEO and chief editor of the Israel Broadcasting Authority, as well as of Israel Radio. Yoni was a captain in an IDF intelligence unit. He has degrees in Arabic and East Asian studies. And while he was working as a correspondent in Tunisia, he was the first Israeli journalist ever to interview Yasser Arafat. Yoni speaks several dialects of Arabic. He's got senior contacts across the Arab world, and he's often asked to comment on Arab issues. So it's a privilege to have him tonight. Yoni, thank you for joining the AJA. Thank you for having me. All right, well, might let you start with your introduction and take it from there. Okay, I'm gonna talk for like five minutes. I'm sure afterwards uh, you will have questions. I want to talk about uh, the terrorism in the, in the Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, uh, which is uh, growing. We are talking to, today about, uh, I call it a monster of terrorism. Uh, we're talking just uh, in the north of uh, Samaria, the north of the West Bank, you are talking uh, about 2,000 armed terrorists uh, who have established uh, themselves in the last two years uh, in uh, uh, different militias or different terror groups. We're talking about uh, between uh, 20 to 30 terror groups, different uh, terror groups uh, belonging to different uh, organizations or Palestinian uh, factions. Uh, this whole process uh, of these uh, terror groups started after, uh, after May 2021, after the war in Gaza, what we call the uh, uh, Shomer Chomot in Hebrew or the Guardian of the Walls in English. This process started uh, during the Bennett and Lapid uh, government uh, and uh, actually, uh, because of the American pressure from the Biden administration, they did not do anything serious uh, to prevent this, the establishing of this uh, monster of terrorism. So this monster started as a small monster, and it's growing, growing, still growing. So uh, now it's up to the Netanyahu uh, government uh, to do something about it. But of course, uh, Netanyahu also has uh, some fears from the Biden administration. He wants to be invited to the White House. And he also, of course, needs the American uh, help, assistance for uh, uh, the danger of the nuclear uh, Iranian bomb. So uh, this is very, very disturbing situation. Uh, these groups, uh, the terror groups, uh, started two years ago to establish, establish themselves with the guidance of the Revolutionary Guards uh, in Iran, by, headed by uh, uh, General Hussein Salami, uh, and their, the proxy uh, that the Iranian used to establish this uh, group is the Islamic Jihad uh, faction, Palestinian Islamic Jihad faction headed by Ziad al-Nahala, they are the proxy, and with the help of Iran, they uh, started to establish and build this uh, monster of terrorism. Uh, the Iranians gave them a lot of money and also uh, smuggled and are still smuggling big quantities of weapons uh, from Iran to Syria and from Syria to Jordan and from there to the Judea and Samaria to the West Bank. And uh, apparently uh, the Israeli security forces and the Jordanian security forces uh, are not doing enough uh, to stop this phenomena, very dangerous uh, phenomena of, uh, of weapons uh, going into the West Bank. There's no problem today uh, for any young Palestinian uh, 
to to purchase and get a weapon you know and if if he gets money from the terror organizations he can buy a, a gun a pistol whatever he wants and just go out and carry a terror attack in in in, in, in the west bank or in israel itself if he has a permit to, to go into israel so this is a very dangerous uh, situation. Now, uh, the center of what we call the, the capital of terror in the West Bank is Jenin. Uh, even though the, uh, uh, this phenomenon of the armed militias are, are not only in Jenin, they are also in Nablus, in Tulkarem, and now they are moving, spreading to the uh, south and the center of the, the West Bank to Ramallah area. And uh, Jenin is the capital of uh, the terror. This is how we call it. In Israel, uh, Jenin is a very dangerous place. Uh, and now they are uh, trying to adopt the uh, methods used by terror organizations uh, in Gaza or in South Lebanon. And they are uh, starting to manufacture uh, big explosive devices. And also they're trying to build an infrastructure for uh, producing rockets. Uh, the Iranian idea or the, the mythology of, uh, of Qasem Soleimani, General Qasem Soleimani, as you know, who was assassinated by the American army by when Trump was president. Uh, Qasem Soleimani had this uh, uh, vision of surrounding Israel from all the fronts and uh, strangle Israel with uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of rockets, missiles, accurate uh, drones, and so on. So now uh, what the Iranians are trying to do for the last two years is open a new front, uh, not only from Gaza, but also from the West Bank, from Judea and Samaria. And for that, they need rockets in, the, in uh, Judea and Samaria. So now the terrorist organizations are trying to manufacture rockets in the Jenin area. Uh, the uh, Israeli Shabbat, the Shin Bet, already uh, thwarted uh, a few attempts of uh, uh, terror groups to, to start manufacturing this, uh, these rockets, but they have the knowledge, they are getting the, the uh, technical knowledge from Gaza, and they have the money, so I, in my opinion it's only a matter of time uh, uh, if, the Israel, if Israel does not stop that. I, I've been calling, I wrote a few articles, I've been calling uh, for the last two years, when I started to identify, to see the, the, this process in the beginning, I, I wrote a few articles and called the Bennett government and Lapid government to act and kill this uh, monster of uh, terrorism when it's still small, before it grows. But uh, unfortunately, as I said, there was an American pressure and they yield to the American pressure. They didn't do anything. And now even Netanyahu is hesitating and doesn't want to go to a large military operation uh, in the in the north of the, the West Bank. So uh, it's only a matter of time, I think, that there will be until the will be a big terror operation by the Palestinians inside Israel. There will be a lot of casualties, and only then the government will wake up and do something about this uh, phenomenon, which is very dangerous. This is my introduction. Thank you. That's yeah, very, very good summary. Um, thank you for, for informing us what's going on. And since you started um, with Judea Samaria, we might start with a question um, about that. We know uh, Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas is 87 years old. He's nearing his 20th year of the four year term he was elected for. Uh, can you comment on his health and what do you think is going to happen in Judea Samaria when Abbas eventually dies? Uh, well, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, uh, Abu Mazen, as we call him, or they call him in Arabic also, is uh, um, not going to stay for long in the political arena, Palestinian political arena. His health situation is not good. Um, uh, he has heart problems. And just for your information, the doctor which is taking care of him is an Israeli doctor. A, a, a heart specialist. Uh, we don't know his name because it's confidential, but uh, we we know it for sure. That even some uh, of the sources in the, the top of the PA, they've confirmed that he has an Israeli doctor. And there is also a, a special arrangement uh, with Israeli Shinbet, Shabak, 
uh, that when he had he has some heart problems uh, uh, to transfer him very quickly to an Israeli hospital and not uh, not let him die in Ramallah, not, not let him uh, be, be t- t- taken care of in the Ramallah hospital because they don't trust their own doctors. So uh, um, Israel is helping him to stay alive, uh, not only <laughs> physically, I think, but also politically. Uh, so uh, because they see him as the uh, as the somebody who is willing to cooperate with Israel, cooperate with Americans, with the Egyptians, with the Jordanians, and uh, and keep the calm uh, and not uh, have a, a military intifada like Yasser Arafat in, initiated in 2000 after the failure of the Kim David um, uh, summit. So. Uh, Abu Mazen is very, very con- convenient for the Israelis, for convenient for the Americans and the, and the Jordan and Egypt. And uh, what will happen after he goes down? This is a big question because already now uh, there are a few Palestinian figures in the top of the Fatah movement who are competing uh, who will succeed him. So in order to succeed him, they have their own military militias that they have established in the last uh, few years because uh, the possibility to have a general election uh, in the coming uh, months or the coming year is it looks very far because of the security uh, situation, both in uh, West Bank and Gaza. And uh, they're taking into the possibility that it will be very difficult to, because of the violence, uh, to have an election. So they are uh, talking about uh, an interim uh, leadership or interim successor until there will be elections. And actually they are competing now who will be the one who will succeed him until there will be general elections. So there are a few names uh, out there uh, in the top of the Fatah movement, as I said. Uh, one of them is Hussein al-Sheikh, who is the... Uh, uh, General Secretary of the uh, of the Executive Committee of the PLO, we have uh, General Majid Faraj, who is the head of the Palestinian Intelligence. We have uh, Mahmoud El Alul, who is the deputy of uh, Abu Mazen in the Fatah movement, and we have uh, Jibril Rajoub, who, um, who is a, a senior member in the Fatah movement. Also, we're talking about four or five. Uh, senior Palestinians in Fatah who have their own militias and see themselves, they see themselves as the potential successor of Abu Mazen. So it sounds like it's going to be a bit of a bloodbath on, on the Palestinian uh, side of things. Yes, Israel, Israel is very worried about, and also, of course, the Americans are very worried about uh, the Egyptians and the Jordanian because they understand that the this, uh, uh, after he steps down, he, he can die or he can be out uh, still alive but not be able to function. Uh, this will uh, immediately may uh, bring an armed confrontation in the West Bank, in, in Judea and Samaria. And uh, there will be violence, there are these militias that will fight. And we have to remember that we have Half a million Israelis who live in the West Bank in Judea and Samaria, and they travel on the on the on the roads, the main roads in the in, in the Judea and Samaria, so they can become targets very easily. Uh, so in such a scenario, the IDF is already preparing the possibility that uh, uh, if there will be a, a, such a, a military confrontation that might deteriorate into a civil war inside the Palestinian society. Uh, and of course, Hamas also is going to, to be involved in it because uh, they want the elections. They don't want Fatah to keep controlling the West Bank. They want to take over like they did in Gaza. So there's even a scenario, a contingency plan of the IDF that in such a case that things will go out of control completely and there will be danger also for the Israeli citizens who live there that the army Israeli army will reoccupy the whole of the West Bank, even area A, when the, the PA now is controlling, uh, and to calm things down, and afterwards to try and have a general elections for the presidents. Wow. Um, 
every time we see uh, terrorist attacks when Jews are killed um, in Judea, Samaria, and other areas of Israel, we see Arabs handing out sweets, shooting fireworks. How widespread are these sentiments? And do you think they reflect uh, Arab society? Definitely, they reflect uh, reflect Arab society and the Muslim uh, beliefs, uh, because uh, they think that they, they believe. Actually, it's a it's a religious belief that anyone who is who dies from an Israeli or Jewish uh, uh, person uh, being killed by Jews or Israelis Israeli soldiers. Is a martyr, they call it in Arabic shaheed, and uh, he is placed in heaven, is, uh, is guaranteed, he's going straight to heaven. And uh, this is a big celebration because uh, he's uh, like, you know, did something for God, and this is why they have to celebrate, not, uh, not only his close uh, family that is celebrating, and as, this, and as you said, uh, there's uh, making uh, giving candies away and su such a thing, but this is a big thing for the whole Palestinian society that we have sacrificed another shaheed, another martyr for the uh, sake of liberation of Palestine. What they say, what they call it, you know. Crazy, it's crazy to think that some people want to give them a state. Um, <clears throat> but m moving on to a wider topic, so the Abraham Accords, uh, there are significant achievement under President Trump. And at the time, it seemed that there was momentum for more nations to join. Um, but since Biden took office, no further agreements have been signed. So who do you think will be next? And who do you think will be amongst the last Arab states ever to make peace with Israel? Where are the holdouts? Look, this normalization process is very, uh, it's very dangerous because, uh, as you know, of course, you follow the news, you know that there are now secret uh, uh, not so secret, but what is ha happening behind the scenes is secret. There are contacts uh, as in the United States, the uh, Biden administration is the mediator now between Israel and Saudi Arabia, uh, trying to have a, a normalization uh, agreement between Israel and Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is the leader of the Sunni world. So this is very important uh, for Israel. Uh, and uh, Israel is, this is actually one of the, the goals that uh, the Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, just announced as the minute he became a Prime Minister again, he said that this is the one of the most important goals for him to achieve a normalization agreement with Saudi Arabia. Uh, now, uh, the momentum of, uh, of the normalization that was when time it was when President Trump uh, was uh, president of the United States. This momentum has stopped, and uh, of course there is a direct connection between the the backing of the American administration to Israel and the uh, the backing, uh, especially concerning Iran, uh, to what is happening now because uh, Biden administration got weaker in the Middle East. And uh, actually, they after their withdrawal from Afghanistan, they lost a lot of credit in the Middle East. Uh, and after the attack uh, that the Iranians attacked in 2019, still when Trump, Trump was the president, they attacked with missiles and drones the uh, oil facilities of Saudi Arabia in El Bukek. And they paralyzed the half of the uh, Saudi uh, oil production. Uh, and the United States didn't do anything about it. Uh, so um, uh, the Arab countries, the moderate Arab countries, the Gulf countries are very uh, disappointed with the Biden administration. And uh, China came in because uh, the Biden administration is very weak and China went into the, the game and uh, mediated between Saudi Arabia and Iran and achieved the reconciliation between them. And uh, this is effect, affecting badly the possibility for uh, Israel to have a normalization agreement with the Saudi Arabians. So this is one aspect. The second aspect is that the Saudis are not stupid. Uh, they want to collect a high price from Israel and from the United States for a normalization agreement between 
Saudi Arabia and Israel. For instance, they demand uh, that uh, the, the United States will give them a uranium enrichment facility. So they will have the same ability as Iran in reaching uranium. So they can do it also on their own. That means that they're also going for a nuclear bomb in, in the head of the process. So this is a lot of uh, implication for such a thing. Uh, this is opening a, a nuclear race in the Middle East. And uh, of course, uh, if they will have, a, the Saudis will have a nuclear bomb, also the, the Turks will want a nuclear bomb and uh, Egypt will want a nuclear bomb. So, and also it is very dangerous for Israel because uh, right now we have good uh, relationship with Saudi Arabia, but who knows what will be in the future? We can never know. So this is a, a very dangerous thing. The second thing is the Palestinian issue. <coughs> the, the Arab countries that want to normalize the relationship with Israel and especially Saudi Arabia, they say, no, we cannot go forward with this normalization because we have to get something in return concerning the uh, Palestinians. Uh, and what they want is an Israeli ag uh, agreement or uh, at least commitment to go in the, the end of the peace process with the Palestinians, that there will be an independent Palestinian state in Judea and Samaria with East Jerusalem as its capital <coughs> and the Temple Mount, Al-Aqsa Mosque, handed over to the Palestinians. So I don't see any prime minister who can make any concessions concerning these two sticking issues. So, and I personally we have to also remember that the uh, relationship between uh, the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and President Biden are very bad because of the, if you remember the Hashukji uh, murder that happened in Turkey when uh, President Biden, he came out even before he was elected and said that he will ne never shake the hand of uh, Ben Salman, he will never invite him to the United States. And then they published the intelligence report blaming, putting the blame on the murder of Hashukji on Muhammad Ben Salman, on the crown prince. So there's a, a big hatred between Muhammad Ben Salman and uh, 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 President Biden. And from what I hear from uh, Saudi journalists that I speak to, they say, they estimate that uh, they are waiting for uh, uh, the next uh, president in the United States, hoping that uh, it will be from the Republican Party. And they don't see uh, Mohammed bin Salman giving the, pres the uh, President Biden the, this gift of uh, a, a political achievement before the uh, uh, presidency elections in the United States. Um, turning to an internal um issue in Israel. We, we're seeing frequent news reports, especially this year, about the internal Arab murders and violence amongst Arabs in Israel. Can you make a comment about what's going on? And is this unusual for Arab culture or for the Middle East, or is this pretty typical? No, this is a part of the of the, the Arab culture, but uh, also the, the police is, uh, Israeli police is paralyzed. And they are not uh, doing anything uh, serious about it. You know, uh, Lapid government tried to do something. There was uh, uh, this guy, Yov Segalovich, who was a senior police officer. Then he ran to the Knesset. And he was the, uh, in, ch in, in charge of the project to uh, take care of this violence in the Arab society. And he started to do important things. Uh, but unfortunately, now uh, Itamar Ben Gvir is the. Uh, Minister for Internal uh, Security, for Police uh, Affairs, and uh, he actually cancelled this project of the of uh, that Segalovich started, and uh, the police is now actually helpless uh, to what is happening as far as the violence in the Arab sector. This is very alarming. The police is in a very bad situation. Uh, for different reasons. This is not a process that started now. It, the process started a few years ago, but also the personal uh, relations, uh, relationship between uh, Itamar Ben Gvir, who is the minister, and the chief of the police, uh, Kobi Shaptai, are very bad. So this is an effect on the, the way the police uh, can operate and function in the Arab sector. Uh, the, the situation is horrible. 
David, did you want to ask a question? Sure. Th thank you. Uh, Yoni, to what extent is Islamic theology uh, driving the conflict? Uh, and, and how influence are the imams and the preaching that we see on videos uh, that are made on, on Fridays? It's very effective, and uh, you have a major player here, uh, which is called the Hamas movement, mm -hmm. which is a, a, a Muslim movement, terror movement, uh, that is very similar to Al-Qaeda or ISIS in their ideology. All of these uh, terror uh, movements, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, ISIS, uh, um, uh, Al-Qaeda, Hamas, Islamic Jihad, all of them are originated from the Muslim Brotherhood movement uh, that is uh, denying the right of Israel to exist and the right of uh, a Jew having sovereignty over a Muslim. So, but what, uh, it's not only the mosques that are uh, active in this incitement. You know, of course, I'm sure you have uh, children, grandchildren. You know, today is the social, the social media. Yeah. is the main influencer of the public opinion. So the incitement, you know, I have a son, he doesn't even watch television. He, everything is on the, on the social media. So today, especially TikTok, TikTok is very popular. Uh, so er, the incitement there is horrible. Uh, you, if you go into TikTok and you understand Arabic, you will see terrible things. Incitement against the Jews, incitement against the Israelis, everything there is horrible. And this is very effective. They, uh, uh, they run, for instance, yesterday they ran a short video, how to kill Jews, how to perform terror attacks. And this is spreading. And uh, also the terrorists who are carrying attacks, uh, if they stay alive, they come out on the TikTok and, uh, and uh, saying uh, what happened and uh, get the, the honor of a hero. So uh, this is very, very uh, dangerous incitement on the uh, social media. And I think that uh, there's not much can be done about this uh, phenomenon in the social media. It's very dangerous. One of the things in Islamic theology that uh, puzzles me is that it actually does identify that the land of Israel is for the Jewish people. I'll just show uh, one example of which there are uh, numerous, but this is uh, Quran Surah 17.104, where uh, it, it refers to... Uh, Ban Israel, to the Israelis, yes. Yeah. Ban, you read it in Arabic, yeah. You can read it in Arabic? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, yeah, this is, this, this is true. But look, uh, the problem in the Quran is that you have different, uh, different uh, things that are contradicting also. You can have one chapter praising the Jews and the other one against them. It depends, yeah. on, the, the, it depends on the period in Islam when these things were written. Uh, but what the danger is that uh, what Hamas is doing, they are distorting. They are distorting the Quran. They are, they are yes, distorting the... At. Yeah, and they are taking whatever they want and, and turn it into... Uh, an incitement weapon against the Jews and against, and they have the, the Hamas covenant, for instance, Hamas covenant um, that is calling for the destruction of Israel and very anti-Semitic also. Uh, they are basing uh, most of, uh, of the, if you read this covenant uh, in English, you can see the, they're, they're basing it on, uh, on sentences, not from the Quran, but from the Hadith. Hadith is the, what we call Torah Shebe al -Pay. In uh, yeah, understand. Yeah, uh, and there and there, there are, this is based on stories that the Prophet Muhammad uh, said to the close people that, that uh, were accompanying him at, at that time, and the horrible things about the Jews, and, and so they are playing with this. Uh, of course, they are not emphasizing what you just uh, showed us right on the screen. They are emphasizing the other side, uh, which is attacking the Jews. Okay, Yoni, my, my last question before we open it up is uh, the Australian government uh, is currently a Labor government. It came in a year ago, so we now have a left of centre uh, government. 
and it is currently considering the possibility of recognizing a state of Palestine. Um, would that be helpful or harmful? Harmful, of course, harmful. Why? Because uh, the, the, this land is, uh, according to our beliefs, is a Jewish land, not a Palestinian land. And uh, the, what, I, let's, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a good example, why not? Because history, the short history of the state of Israel shows that any withdrawal of Israeli forces from what is called Arab or Palestinian territories by the, by, by the media, every withdrawal, they turned it into a terror based against Israel. And the best example is the Israeli withdrawal from Gaza Strip. So this uh, Gaza Strip, they, I remember in the negotiation, I was participating in all the negotiations as a journalist covering it. I remember that they promised us that if you withdraw from Gaza, we will uh, transfer Gaza and make it uh, make it Singapore. It will be it will be very successful economically, and uh, you will see that uh, we are heading for peace and so on. Of course, it was a big lie. And what we have now, we have uh, Hamastan. I call it Hamastan on the name of Hamas. Yes, what we have is Hamastan in Gaza. They have all they doing is manufacturing rockets and building tunnels to infiltrate into Israel. So if you do that in the West Bank, you will have the same thing. So we, we, so to give them a, a, just even to agree to such a thing is, a, I, I call, it, call, call it a security suicide. Yep. Look, we're, we're on the same page, Yoni. I just okay. wanted to, to uh, uh, have, have you say it. Actually, without... I just, actually, I just wrote uh, an article today about it because Netanyahu, I think yesterday or before yesterday, he made a statement that Israel wants to help the PA, the Palestinian Authority, and to strengthen it and so on. But we are against the Palestinian state. So yeah. he finally said it. Yes. He finally said it. I think it's very important, the declaration of Netanyahu. Yeah, no, we, we, we've put that statement on our social media as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, well do you want to give an update for next week? Or... Yes, yeah, certainly. Okay, well, next week um, we have as our guest uh, Ephraim Zoroff from the uh, uh, Simon Wiesenthal Centre, and we're going to be talking about the efforts of hunting down Nazis in Australia, the history of that, and some of the uh, obstacles that were uh, come across in that process will actually uh, surprise you, uh, obstacles uh, from the Australian government at the time. And finally, as we do every week, uh, at the end of this event, um, please do something to support AJA. Uh, go to the website. Um, if you're not a member, you can apply for membership. And don't forget, it's the end of the financial year coming up, and you can also uh, consider making a donation to AJA or to AJA Sadaka. Um, the latter is tax deductible. Thank you. Okay, now we've got a lot of questions, very big turnout today. So let's start with Leon. Would you like to ask your question? Uh, yeah. You spoke about American pressure on Israel. Um, what is the uh, perceived American interest and, of course, the European interest in, in effect, enabling Arab Palestinian terrorists to murder Jews? Look, the uh, American administration, Biden administration, they are uh, criticizing Israel and putting pressure on Israel. Um, they are afraid that uh, Israel will uh, invade, yes, invade uh, areas A, which is uh, the parts in the West Bank where, where the Palestinian Authority is in charge, according to the Oslo agreements. And they take over the whole territory of uh, Judea and Samaria uh, to prevent terrorism. And why they are so worried, the Americans? Because Biden is very persistent to revive this idea of two-state solution. Um, everybody knows that uh, there's not going to be a Palestinian, independent Palestinian state. And 
uh, even the internal Palestinians uh, polls, uh, public opinions uh, polls that are making uh, show that the majority of the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza do not believe in the two-state solution and they support the armed struggle against Israel. We're talking about between 70 to 80% of the population. So, but uh, uh, apparently the Biden administration is still holding to this uh, dream. I call it a dream or fantasy that will never come true because uh, even the Palestinians don't want it. So, uh, and they keep putting pressure on Israel, especially on the, on the settlement issue because they are claiming that once you build the settlements, you, you deprive more land from the Palestinians, and this is narrowing the possibility of having a two-state solution. Uh, but I think that they know the truth, but uh, this is uh, part of the, uh, maybe the Democratic Party agenda uh, or the progressive agenda, whatever you call it, uh, and uh, President Biden still believes in it. Democrats are a disaster. Um, all right, next we've got uh, Jeff. Would you like to unmute and ask your question? Shalom. An explanation as to the nature of Arab, Arab, Arab philosophy and theology is the fact that in the early stages of the Quran, when Muhammad was weak, he wrote warm and wonderful, warm in glow type articles, uh, articles or theses, if you want to call it that. And later on, when he was more powerful, he was talking all about killing the Jews as per the rock and the tree communicating about how to kill Jews. I think the best explanation to the duplicitous nature of some Arab theology, which also says that, that you don't have to make peace with the Jews and you can lie in treaties, is that you cannot, you simply cannot make treaty with these people for the simple reason that anything they do, they can always vitiate, either through the references, as I just quoted, or through the fact that you're allowed to lie in treaties. How do you do, how do you make peace with these people? Well, you mentioned a very important point. Uh, you know, when Yasser Arafat, uh, he signed the Oslo Accords with Israel, he told the, uh, in Arabic the, the Palestinians that it's like the Hudaybiya Agreement. What is the Hudaybiya Agreement? This is the agreement that uh, Prophet Muhammad signed with the Jewish tribes when he was weak. But after that, after he got stronger, he violated the Hudaybiyah agreement and massacred the Jewish tribes. So this is what this is what they believe in. They say, now we are weak, let's make agreement, peace agreement. Yes, they, let's say it's a peace agreement with the Jews until we get stronger. And once we're stronger, we will massacre the Jews like Prophet Muhammad did. So we're not doing anything wrong. We're going in the same path of Prophet Muhammad. So what does it mean? Does it mean that we cannot make a, a, a agreements with them? No, we should make agreements with them, but they have to be very uh, strict security uh, measures as part of the deal. And Israel must control uh, the sensitive points in the West Bank uh, uh, so that we will have the military advantage over them. Otherwise, we cannot sign anything with them. So we have to have strong, uh, uh, strong security leverage on the Palestinians that if they violate and try to, uh, to do something else, that we will be in control. Hey, Gary, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, um, thanks for dropping in on us. Um, Arab leaders, mainly the ones outside of the um, Abraham Accord, must realize there's not going to be a Palestinian state. Is there any pressure from those Arab leaders for, for their countries on Palestinians or on Saudi Arabia to come up with agreements with Israel so they can all move on and be able to trade with Israel? I don't think so. I think so. I think that the last move that the Saudis did when they reconciled with Iran uh, was a big surprise for the Arab leaders. And they are very worried from what is happening from the Saudi Arabia came to the conclusion that they cannot count on uh, President Biden to defend them from Iran. And they can also cannot also count on Israel to defend them from Iran because 
the Biden administration is against the Likud uh, government or the uh, right-wing government in Israel. So they had to find themselves uh, a security. So they say, if you cannot beat them, join them. So what they did, they reconciled with Iran and joined Iran. So this is very alarming because uh, uh, the Crown Prince Mohammed Ben Salman, he doesn't want to be a hero. He wants to survive and become the next king of Saudi Arabia. So he said, why should I have a fight with the Iranians? I, I, I cannot have any protection from Israel or from the uh, United States. So let me reconcile with Iran. At least I'll have quiet and I can succeed my father quietly and become the king. Hmm. Okay. Alan, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yeah. Thanks, David. And hi, everybody. Uh, Yoni, uh, I recently spent uh, about six days in Dubai, and it's uh, currently a very welcoming place for Jews, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe any of the, the, the members of the Abraham Accords made any statement on the Palestinians before they made uh, peace with Israel. So why, why is everybody expecting the Saudis to include some condition on the Palestinians uh, in, in order to move into a, a, an Abraham Accords? This is a lip, a lip service for the Palestinians. They don't believe this uh, the creations that you hear for the Palestinian cause. The Emirates, they hate the Palestinians. The Palestinians hate them. It's a real hatred. Uh, I, I want to remind you just before the, uh, the, the peace agreement to, between Israel and the Emirates was a sign there were Emirates coming to the Temple Mount to visit, to going to, wanted to go Muslims to pray in Al-Aqsa Mosque, and they were kicked out by the Palestinians, you know, by the Palestinian waqf, the Islamic waqf in the Temple Mount. So they hate, the, 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 the uh, Palestinians hate the Emirates and they hate them. All what you see, declarations for the Palestinian cause and solving the Palestinian problems and independent state for the Palestinians, this is only lip service. They don't really believe in it. Okay, next we've got... Uh... Uh, my good friend, uh, Neil Kafakis, and uh, uh, I'll mention that Neil is a, uh, a Syrian refugee who's uh, <laughs> living in Australia and a good friend of AJA. Yours, Neil. Hi, good evening. Good evening, good evening. gentlemen. Hi, Yoni. How are you? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Where are you from Syria? Where are you? I'm from Ah, from Hummus. I'm a Messiahi. I'm a Messiahi. Ah, a Messiahi. Now, this, uh, 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 yeah, you know, actually, I, I don't want to ask a question. I want to ask your point or your, your idea. There's two points here. One is, I think, after 40 years living in these Islamic countries and in Syria, I think the main problem and the main danger for, for us both, for the people in that, in that area and for Israel, are the Islamic Brotherhood Party. Yes. And when I am saying Islamic Brotherhood Party, I mean both sides of the coin, the Sunni side and the Shi'i side. The Sunni side, which is Hamas and other Brotherhood uh, parties and jihad, the jihad, Islamic Jihad. And when I'm saying the Shia, I mean the Hezbollah and Iran. And you are exactly, you know what I mean exactly. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, and I think this is the first point I need you to hear from you. And the second point, you guys, you need to know that about Saudi Arabia, it's very important to know that Saudi Arabia is not Arabic country. It's the leader of the Islamic countries. Any decision came from Saudi Arabia, they will not just see the Arabic side, even if they want to do that deal. No, there is another side. It's very important to see which is the Islamic side. And that's very heavy for them also. And I think that the last point, I think we will never have impasse for Israel in Damascus one day, and this is my hope, one day to have this, till we have a strong leaders in USA. What do you think? 
Yes, I, I generally I agree with you totally. Uh, the the uh, Islamic uh, Brotherhood movement is uh, very dangerous, as 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 you said, and I said before. Also, all the terror organizations we're talking about: uh, Hamas, Islamic Jihad, uh, ISIS, Al Qaeda, uh, Boko Haram. All these terror organizations, Islamic terror organizations, they all came out from the womb. Of the uh, of the Ikhwan uh, al-Muslimin of the uh, brothers, uh, the the Muslim Brotherhood. This is very dangerous, and uh, you know, you come from Syria. You know uh, how Hafez al-Assad, the father father of Bashar al-Assad, how he massacred uh, the uh, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in Hama, and also Bashar al-Assad now in the during the Arab Spring. He also massacred a few uh, hundred thousands of, uh, of uh, Muslim, Sunnite Muslims. Uh, uh, so uh, even the Syrian regime see them as a very big danger for uh, for the Alawites, for the uh, uh, for Bashar Assad, for Bashar Assad family and Bashar, Bashar Assad re regime. So uh, uh, this is a danger not only in Syria in the whole Middle East and uh, for instance in Saudi Arabia. Uh, or in Bahrain, uh, these are outlawed. The Muslim Brotherhood is outlawed. They are considered terror organizations. So that is Hamas, and so is the Islamic Jihad. They are considered terrorists. And actually, they say that uh, uh, Muhammad ben Samal, Salman ordered the, the killing of Jamal Hachukji because he was a, a Muslim Brotherhood uh, person. Do you, do you think the... Um agreement between Iran and the Saudis, between the Shiite and Sunni um, will last? And what, what can you comment on how, how is it that a Shia country like Iran and organizations like Hezbollah can partner with Sunni organizations like Palestinian Islamic Jihad? What, what's the connection there? They cannot, uh, this agreement cannot last because uh, these are, you know, Shia and, uh, and uh, Sunni in Islam, uh, it's it's about 1,500 years uh, dispute, and these are two parallel lines in Islam that cannot can never meet. Uh, but what we see now is a, a mutual interest, a temporary interest, both of Iran and Saudi Arabia to have this re reconciliation and to have the benefits of this reconciliation. How long will it last? I don't think it will last for long, but uh, it's, it all depends also uh, what will happen the, in, the, in the American elections, uh, presidency, who will be the next president, and what will be his policy towards Iran, and uh, if there will be the Republicans, uh, there's a good chance that uh, this will be a good ladder for uh, Saudi Arabia to go down from this uh, tree of reconciliation with Iran. And we've got a written question I'll ask. So, um... Well, David mentioned before that um, the Labour government here is talking about potentially recognizing the state of Palestine. We know some of the Australian Jewish organizations, I, I think all of them except for AJA, their argument is pretty much they they support a Palestinian state, they want to work towards it, but now's not the right time or, or something along those lines. Do you think that's a powerful enough argument uh, to be making to the Australian government? Or no, what are your thoughts? no, no. No, no, I feel pity for these people. I, be, I tell you why, because I, I'm sure that the, they have good intentions, but they are naive. They are naive. They don't understand the, the Arab culture, the Palestinian culture, the, 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 the Muslim religion. They don't see the, uh, the double talk. They don't understand the double talk of the Palestinians, and the, um, uh, they don't understand that this is only a phase, a phase. Establishing an independent Palestinian state is only a phase in the destruction of Israel in the future. This is the first step that they want to reach so they will have a, an entity, like they have a terror entity now in Gaza Strip from where they can attack Israel. So now they want to take over the West Bank to have the same thing as happened in Gaza. And, and this is a big danger for Israel. And uh, unfortunately, people don't understand that because maybe the Israeli Asbara is a is very weak, maybe, I don't know what, what exactly, you know, Australia better than me, but I think that these people should be explained thoroughly. What, what does it mean? And uh, I don't understand where, where this support is coming from. 
Yeah, I mean, we, we use very similar words to you, naive, to, to describe them as well. Um, let's go to Anne. Would you like to unmute and ask your question? Hi. So if Trump wins the 2024 election, I'm saying if, and because he managed to have some form of peace, the Abraham Accord in the Middle East, if he can get peace between Israel and Palestine, how would Islamic terrorists like Hamas, Muslim Brotherhood, uh, ISIS, Boko Haram react if Israel is able to get peace with its neighbor Palestine and if there could be a, a dialogue in the future for more peace? This is, of course, a hypothetical question. I can, if there will be peace between Israel and the Palestinians, I will give you $1 million, a present from me to you. As as uh, as one American journalist said uh, once, uh, I will have a uh, hair on my hand. Uh, will grow on my hand if there will be peace. Peace is impossible. Peace is impossible. It's against the uh, ideology of the PLO, not only of Hamas. It's against the uh, Muslim religion. There's no way there will be. Uh, Peace. The only thing that can happen is an interim agreement for a certain period of time that will be called peace. But of course, it will not hold because uh, the red lines that we have and the red lines that the Palestinians have can never meet, they can never be compromised. So it's only a waste of time. Y Yoni, uh, we've had a written, another written question about uh the consideration of israel extending sovereignty into uh yehuda and shomron uh do you think that would help what's the current state of play is there any possibility that israeli sovereignty will be extended this is very important to have a jewish sovereignty we have to put immediately half a million jews inside the west bank inside the judea and samaria once there will be one million Israelis live in the Judean Samaria. I think that we will see a process of Palestinians leaving the West Bank and going abroad, going to Jordan, going to other places to live because the reality on the ground will change. The demographic reality will start to change. This is what we have to work on before even uh, declaring sovereignty of uh, the Judean Samaria. We have to create facts on the ground. And this is why the settlement uh, project is very, very important. And I'm, I'm very happy now with the policy of the Israeli government concerning uh, intensifying the settlements in the West Bank. This is very, very important to put as much Jews as you can inside the territory itself and control the main roads. And this way, and build, of course, build houses and bring people in. This will strengthen Israel's security. Yeah, there's been some very positive announcements uh, lately. Would, Hugh, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Uh, yes, Yoni, we're doing a series called Whose Land? And um, one of the people that we interviewed was Mordecai Kedar. And, yes, um, Mordecai Kedar is a good friend of mine. Yes. Oh, good. He's a great guy. Um, yeah. The question I've got, uh, like, like, like us, he certainly doesn't believe in the two-state solution. What he believes, as I understand it, is yeah, he believes he has this plan for the clans. Yeah, I, I know the, yeah. Uh, the, the, the yeah. What yeah. do you think about not, that? Look, it's good. It's it's good to have new ideas, and uh, you know we we appear together sometimes on television and uh, 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 lectures. And of course, I'm always against this uh, plan of uh, Professor Kedar. Why? Because this is a dream. It will never come true. We'll never go for that. The Palestinians will never go for that. And if the Israelis will want to go for that and to implement it, they will not agree. And uh, so it's not practical. Basically, he's right in what he's saying, but this is not something practical and will never work. And also the Palestinians will not accept it and the international community will not uh, uh, accept it. So we're just fantasizing about it. Yeah, I, I can see that too. <laughs> so in other words, the Palestinians really will never get self-determination and that's their own fault. Yes, because they don't want, they don't, you have to understand that they are not willing to coexist with Israel. This is a big lie. And yeah. uh, uh, 
I saw this lie with my own eyes when I interviewed Yasser Arafat in Tunis in 1993, before the Oslo Accords. And I saw the way he spoke then and afterwards, the minute he came here into the West Bank, he, he changed 100%. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, you cannot believe them. This is something that is a phase. They want to take over the West Bank, Judea and Samaria as a phase in the way to destroy Israel, exactly as they did in Gaza. So we can, we can never have peace with them, never. As I said, the only thing we can have is interim arrangements so they can leave, I would say, give them autonomy because we don't want to control them, give them autonomy, but the security issue, this security, overall security, a responsibility should always be in the hand of the IDF, in the hand of Israel. Otherwise, we will have a terror state like we have in Gaza. Okay. We've had a few uh, reading questions on the topic of your, you mentioned your uh, interview with Yasser Arafat. So people want to know, how did that come about? Um, what, can you make some comments on it? What was he like in person? I uh, was invited, uh, I was at that time, talking about 1993, I was uh, uh, the reporter for uh, Israeli television for uh, the West Bank in Gaza. I was covering uh, all the events. I covered the first intifada that was in 1988. And I, I had, and I still have very good relations uh, with the Palestinian uh, figures uh, in the West Bank in Gaza. And uh, I was invited by Arafat. Uh, at that time, it was forbidden uh, for Israel to have any contact with the PLO. It was against the law. Uh, and one day, I received the fax from Arafat's office to my uh, to my office, inviting me. So I took it to the head of the Israeli Broadcasting Authority, who was at that time. And I said, "Look, I got the invitation. What do you? What do you? This was before Oslo." And nobody even know that Oslo was going on behind the scenes. So he said, I have to check it with the security authorities. So we went to the Mossad, we went to the Shabak, to the Shin Bet. And they said, that, look, we have to, we want to send a journalist with a TV crew for an interview with Arafat. Do we have permission? This is against the law. So he said, give us a few days to check. And after a few days, they gave me the clearance to go. So everybody was shocked. Nobody believed it in Israel. They would say, you will not get in. They will not allow you. And if you get in, you will be in prison. So I said, okay, I, I know I, I was young at that time. I wanted to take, uh, you know, I, I liked adventures at that time. Ah, so I said, I'll go. What, what can be the worst thing that will happen? <laughs> and uh, yeah, I was naive too. You know, when you're young, you are naive. So... Uh, I went there, I, I flew through Italy, from Italy to Tunis, and at the airport of Tunis, there was a guy named Jibril Rajoub, who is now one of the leaders who are competing uh, to succeed Arafat, and he was waiting for me in the airport with a Klachnikov in his hand with a assault rifle. And when we came down, me and the crew, TV crew, to... Uh, to go to the passports uh, inspection. Uh, he was waiting for us there with a gun and he's, he frightened the uh, uh, the TV crew that was with me. And he said, oh, we're talking you now to jail. And they started crying and we were very, but I knew him before uh, because he lived in, the, in Hebron and he was deported. And I knew him while, while he was still living in Hebron before he was deported by Israeli army to Tunis. So. What actually happened, they took us to a restaurant and we had a very fam a famous restaurant in Tunis and we had a big lunch. And the next day I was taken to Arafat. And uh, this was uh, also a very, very interesting thing. What happened, uh, uh, I wanted to go to Arafat. He was, his office was in a villa in one of the quarters of uh, Tunis, the, the capital of Tunisia. And uh, I said, how do I get there? How do I go to see Arafat? So they told me on the phone, the, the spokesperson of the PLO told me, just take a cab from your hotel. And uh, this is the address, Yogarta Street, uh, number one, uh, 110. And just tell the driver, and five minutes from your hotel, 
I was staying in the Hilton Hotel, and you'll be in Arafat's office. Okay, so I had to go there in 10 in the morning the next day. So we were very excited to have this. Uh, and I was getting phone calls from Israel. How did you enter Tunis? Are you really going to enter? I said, we'll see tomorrow if there really is an interview or not. They said, no, no, this is a trick. You will never be interviewed by you. You, you wait for nothing. I said, okay, I'll try it. So we took a cab from the hotel. We went to the office of Arafat. There is a roadblock 50 meters from the office. We went from off the uh, taxi. We approached the armed guards that were in the roadblocks. And I hear them talking in Arabic, saying the Jews are coming, the Jews are coming. And in one minute, there was a, a squad of armed PLO terrorists surrounding us with weapons drawn at us. So this captain, of the PLO, he comes and asks me, are you Jewish? In Arabic, I said, yes, I am a proud Jewish, not only Jewish. And I'm the personal guest of Yasser Arafat. And Arafat is expecting me in the office. He said, no, you're a liar. We'll take you to custody. I said, okay. Just know that I'm, Arafat is waiting for me. And there was a big thing there until the uh, personal secretary of Yasser Arafat, he came out from, uh, from the office and he, he kicked out the guards and they let us in, into the uh, office of Arafat. Now I knew, I, I saw a picture of Arafat, I never knew who he is. I was following his interviews, I was following the media. So I go into his office and all of a sudden, a small man jumps at me and hugs me, embracing me. My brother, my brother, you are my brother, you are a brother. This was Arafat, started kissing me. <laughs> Not only me, the whole crew that was with me, the photographer, the, the sound man, he made a big show of love to us. And then uh, we made an interview with him. And after we made the interview, we wanted to go back to the hotel. He said, no, you're not going there. I said, what? He said, there is lunch. Nobody steps into the office Arafat without having lunch. And they opened an the, inner the door and there was a big table for us waiting with all kinds of food. And he said, you come, you sit next to me. You are my brother. Nice. And he pulled me, a big show, and I, he pulled me to sit next to him. And when I sat next to him, he started feeding me because this is the Arab custom. If you appreciate a guest, you feed him. So he takes a, a small fish, a big a, a fish, a small fish. He takes rice. He, he makes like this play with it, tells me, open your mouth, and he puts it in. And he was feeding me the whole lunch. Ah, <laughs> ah, ah, wow. Many stories about Arafat. Uh, many stories. I don't think we've ever had an event conclude like that. <laughs> yeah. Amazing story. Um, you've been an amazing guest. Thanks so much, Yoni, for, for joining us tonight and for, for uh, sharing all, the, all your wisdom with us. How can people I'm keep... very happy. Uh, just one remark. I'm very happy that you're doing that. And, and this is a good chance to make us bara. This is why I agree to, to go on. And uh, I, I'm very happy to see such Zionists as you uh, working around the clock for such a purpose. And it's good to know, for Israel to know there are the good Jews over there. Thank you. That's wonderful. How, how can people <laughs> keep up to date with your work? How what? How can people keep up to date with you on, on your social media or where, where do you write for? Of course, you can follow me on Twitter. I don't know if you use, you know, if you use uh, social media. A lot. Yeah, we use it a lot. Okay, so you, the best thing is Twitter, where I put all my articles and my interviews. And uh, of course, you have the website of the JCPA, where I publish in English. And I also have a personal blog in English that uh, you can follow. And I write 
daily analysis on this blog in English. Amazing. Well, I'm sure everyone will. Of course, it's also in Hebrew, but it's also in English. There's a translation to English. So you can read all my articles. And of course, uh, on the Twitter, you, you'll see all my uh, appearances on the TV in English, TV in Arabic, in Hebrew, whatever you want. Perfect. Well, AJ follows you, and I'm sure everyone else will. So thanks again, Yoni. And just before we go, uh, the Lechaim Show with Morris Klein is now on 3 Z. That's all we have time for. Don't forget, you can also keep up to date with what AJA is doing. You can join our free email list at jewishassociation.org.au. You can also follow us on Facebook and all the other social media. For now, we wish you all a very good evening. We look forward to seeing you next week uh, when we have this topic of Nazis in Australia. Thank you so much. Thank you.